insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 42, Disney Plusing the PC. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my patient and loving co-host, Michelle Whalen. <laughs> Patient. Uh, I'm uh, running out of adjectives, sweetheart. I'm telling you, I'm going to get you a thesaurus. you got to help me out. How are you know. doing today? I'm doing okay. So we have a big show today, thanks to, largely to uh, <laughs> Disney launching Not our Disney sponsor. Plus. No. Uh, so the big news this week was the launch of Disney Plus on Tuesday, was it? Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tuesday, we got a lot of really interesting news out of there, a couple of really cool shows, lots and lots of lots and lots of content out of there. So we'll be talking about um, their subscriber numbers after the first couple of days, a uh, little bit of controversy on how they're handling some of their older content on there with a disclaimer. Uh, then we'll talk about, ironically, some Disney memorabilia that uh, we actually were referring to yesterday yeah. watching one of the new documentaries right, on right. Disney+. Plus. Uh, then, because we already had so much stuff in Disney Detective, we moved our Star Wars uh, article to our entertainment news mm -hmm. this week, along with some SpongeBob news, which I'm sure our daughter is very happy about. And uh, yours and my favorite villain on The Walking Dead, some news about Negan. Uh, and then some very cool, insightful picks of the week. So, big show, full show. Uh, ready to get started? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Go for Disney Detective. So, if you've been living under a rock... And you don't have access to the internet or anything. You're not obviously watching us or listening to us. But Disney Plus launched on Tuesday. We've been talking about this for, for months now, you know, when the news broke out. And they actually hit 10 million subscribers one day after the service rolled out. Um, so... Uh, shares of the company ended Wednesday uh, with a 10% increase on the New York Stock Exchange. So for any of you out there like us who are Disney shareholders, yay. <laughs> full, di full disclosure. <laughs> full disclosure. Um, so, I still hate Disney, by the way. Right. Even though we he do still hates stock. it. Right. Um, so Disney's mix, uh, you know, so if you haven't logged on to it, you haven't subscribed to it. Um, it has a mix of uh, Marvel and Star Wars and classic shows and everything. Um, and a lot of you know stuff was available kind of right out of the gate. Um, in April, the company said that it uh, plans to reach 60 million to 90 million more subscribers um, globally by 2024. Um, obviously, Disney invested a lot of money in the service. Uh, it costs about seven dollars uh, a month or seventy a year after a seven-day trial period. Which, when we had talked about it, um, it seemed kind of uh, small in comparison to usually you can get a Netflix subscription, you know, free subscription for 30 days. You know, Disney's just giving you seven days to kind of try it out. Um, customers 
um, with uh, Verizon Wireless and Internet uh, have actually been offered a year subscription uh, for free. So Disney didn't actually break down where their subscriptions came from, whether they were free or a monthly or the yearly. Um, you know, we had been talking that there were offers available for a discounted rate for a two-year subscription or a three-year subscription. So I know the, you know... And that was pushed largely through the D23 fan club. Well, there was D23 fan club that had the offer. There was Disney Visa credit card that had the offer. Uh, DVC discount uh, was doing that as well. So there were a couple of different places where you could get um, get these... Uh, discounts. Um, now, by comparison, Netflix garnered 158 million subscribers since they launched their streaming platform back in 2007 and has about 60 million U.S. subscribers. Now, Disney Plus, which launched in the United States, Canada, and the Netherlands, uh, hit some technical difficulties. There were a couple of glitches that happened for the first couple of days. People were having issues logging on or well, we downloading. We experienced some issues as we well. Had a, we had a couple of issues where we'd go to play and it would say, oops, it couldn't play it. You'd go out, you'd go back in, and then it yeah. eventually did But uh, they did developed work. they developed technical difficulties within the first few hours of launch as Right, well. right, because there were so many people that were, you know, launching it. Plus, the other thing, too, which was kind of weird, was that through um, Apple apps, you could download it a couple of days before, but right. with Google, you actually couldn't download it until it actually launched. They didn't right. allow you to, to do any pre-downloading um, of the app. So, you know, I'm sure that probably helped with some of the the problems that people were, you know, that were having. Um, but, you know, in, in an article, uh, you know, Disney said big launches often often have their hiccups when consumers are fighting to be the first one to have a given service. So I'm sure that was, you know, but I'm sure none thing. of those problems had anything to do with Bob Iger. Only the success no. of it has to do with Bob Iger. <laughs> And obviously, bes bes um, despite reports of the technical glitches, many customers signed up with no problems, and viewers were buzzing about hmm, the Mandalorian, <clears throat> making it a top trending topic on Twitter. Indeed. Hmm, I wonder if that'll be somebody's insightful pick. Yeah, very well, well, don't ruin it for people. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, please, <laughs> they had to know it was going to be. If they know us and they've listened to us long enough, how could we not? Um, so along with Disney Plus hitting uh, that many subscribers, uh, another article came out talking about um, how Disney Plus has outdated cultural depictions disclaimers on classic movies. Well, before we jump to that, I did want to oh, talk sure. briefly Sorry. about uh, the numbers. You know, mm -hmm. they're talking about 10 million subscribers the whole Verizon thing sort of was a last minute announcement. You know, they didn't really announce that ahead of time. Disney's been hawking subscriptions to this for right, left months and right, now. Right, right, right. And this whole Verizon thing didn't come out until very recently. And with Ver the Verizon one, any Verizon customer is entitled to it. Right. So I am curious as to whether or not the bulk of these 10 million subscribers are the free, free subscribers. Right, and that was the thing in the article. It said they they didn't have a breakdown right. of how many were the free. And, and I also wonder how many people that had Verizon, you know, what about people that had already signed up for it? Did they, you know, and then all of a sudden get it for free? Did they, you know, right. have the option? Right, issuing a refund for that. Right, right, because I know... Um, a friend of mine who he signed up, I think he did the two year and he did it back in like June and he got charged for it back in June where I would have thought, well, don't charge my credit don't card until, until it goes, service starts, yeah. you know, where we didn't, you know, I didn't actually sign up for it until a couple of days Disney beforehand. Because Disney didn't need to be making interest on our money. <laughs> well, that was kind of my whole point, you know. I was hoping, but then when I did sign up, it did say that I wasn't going to be charged until after a seven-day period. Right. So we were still kind of getting a seven-day free trial with, with at least ours. Right. I don't know if it was something where you were buying it under a special deal. And if, that seven-day <clears throat> free trial is actually kind of interesting because 
Most other streaming providers give you 30 days. Right, and that's what I, I just said a little while ago was that. And the way that, and that kind of plays into how Disney is dropping their content because they right. only drop one show at launch. Right. And you had to wait for the others to drop mm -hmm. on a regular schedule. Right, so, and now everything will be dropping on Fridays. Right, more so or less, if you so. signed up for your seven day, mm -hmm. you know, free trial, you might get two shows out of it. They're not dropping right. everything for you to binge watch. Right, right. But those subscriber numbers are kind of interesting because um, Apple kind of pulled some shenanigans like that mm -hmm. when they launched launched Apple Plus, where they had a deal where if you buy literally anything from apple you get a free year right which to me that just smacks of desperation mm -hmm. but even with that apple has not released any real numbers on As to, what their subscriber right. rate looks like right yeah now. yeah i haven't seen anything about it yeah. like you know because again as you know you've even said and and we saw it together there's only a couple of shows that they even have they right. don't have you know, a lot of content. So yeah, it's so, almost like here, try it out. And hopefully within, you know, six months we'll, we'll have more. The, so. the whole scheme of subscriber numbers here is really just a game of mm -hmm. numbers for propaganda yeah. purposes. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about the outdated cultural depiction. So obviously now that Disney plus is available and you have all of these classic movies, they kind of wanted to, put it out there that, you know, some of the content might, act, might actually be offensive for this day and age, whereas at the time when the movie came out or the story, you know, we were a little less sensitive, I guess would be the a PC way of saying it. Um, so the disclaimer, uh, which appears a pu uh, it, um sorry, appears ahead of some of the Disney movies, including Dumbo, The Aristocats, Jungle Book, Fantasia, Lady and the Tramp, basically have a basic plot description and then s states that this, you know, program is presented as originally created. And then in most cases, it, you know, it may contain outdated cultural depictions. Uh, you know, the disclaimer on Pinocchio says, you know, more specifically contains tobacco depictions, you know, because there was obviously right. smoking and drinking, um, you know, where, you know, most cartoons that you go and see today, you don't you don't have that. Um, so this was uh, a clip, uh, if you see on our, our screen, um, from The Jungle Book. Um, and it says, experience the song-filled celebration of friendship, fun, adventure, blah, 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 blah. You know, receiving Walt Disney's personal touch. Um, you know, so-and-so, you know, songs. And the program is presented as originally created. It may contain outdated cultural, you know, depictions. So th they're putting this out there, you know, um, you know, some of the, you know, the, the stereotypes of the day that we, you well, know, and, and you know what, this is, this is kind of ridiculous because I wonder Disney still sells DVDs and C and, and, um, right. Uh, Blu-ray of these. Mm -hmm. Do they put the disclaimers on the media that they sell? Too? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, like, you know, the one thing that they were talking about was, um, you know, Peter Pan. The one song is what makes the red man red. You know, you would never refer to a Native no, American. No, but you know what? You did. And, right. And if, right. if they want to cater to cultural sensitivity, right. then they simply shouldn't make the content available because no matter what, even with a disclaimer, the content's going to be um, insulting to to someone. To someone, yeah, and you know, is, is stamping a disclaimer on the content now supposed to make it all better? Because I didn't. I looked through the library and I did not see "Song of the South" well, in the library. Well, and you will never see "Song of the South," and that's but, you know. But, but we can put a disclaimer on it I now know, and make it could. okay, right? Technically, you could, you know, and that's kind of you know, like yeah, if you you're putting this disclaimer out there, you should be able to, you know, put "Song of the South" finally, you know, right? But my, out there. I guess my point is. And that then why, disclaimer does absolutely nothing or why, you to know, hide the fact that Disney in its past right. has created insensitive mm -hmm. material. Yeah. Either you own up to it and you put it out there or you don't. 
You right. don't put it out there and then put a disclaimer in that it may be culturally insensitive. Right. When you know that it is in today's world. So if that's the case and you're concerned about that, then don't put the content out there. Right. It's just that simple. This is Disney trying to whitewash their own history. Well. Which, you know, not surprising coming from Disney. Well, and I think also, too, is a lot of the movies, they're making a lot of the movies available that haven't been available in years. That, yes, people might still have DVDs of, but that that's the other thing you have to remember, too, is that Disney for so long, you know, would put things in the vault and things would come out of the vault and things would go back in the vault. So some of these movies haven't been out on DVD in a while and now they are available. So I think they're they're kind of, you know. And I'm not, I'm not, you know. Right. I don't want to get hung up on the, on the idea that, you know, they didn't put this on their media so it's bad. My point is, Putting a disclaimer out there doesn't make it any less culturally insensitive. Right. Well, if the even, material itself right. can't stand the test of time and it's going to be period specific, then don't put it out there. Right. You know, Disney doesn't have to release this stuff. They no. didn't release all of their library. Well, they pretty so, much um, <laughs> Song of the South. <laughs> they didn't put Song of the South out there. Right. So Disney very carefully right. curated yeah. certain elements yeah. of their library. Yeah, I get it. And if these elements that they have out here now are racially insensitive or culturally insensitive, they should have curated them out instead of putting a disclaimer on them. That's, I mean, that's just, otherwise it's revisionist history. And, and you know, if you start doing that, then you're well, as guilty I, as all those who do it. Well, and I things. think, you know, at least they're not doing, you know, a George Lucas and, oh, let's just change the scene because we don't want Han to shoot first because that. Oh, but they know. are, though, aren't well, they? <laughs> we don't have that article in here, but they did change the hand shot first scene again. But that's what I'm saying. The, how many different times has it has it changed throughout the year? Why? You I, know, I throughout agree. The years. I mean, Lucas so doing least, that is no different than, you know, if Da Vinci decided to change a smile on the Mona Lisa. Right. But you know what? At least they're, you know, putting it out there so that, hey, you know, go ahead and watch this, you know, whatever. And I, and I don't disagree with that right. notion. But my point is, if they're going so far as to put this disclaimer there, they know that it's culturally insensitive. So why even release it mm. at that point? Okay. So, anyway. Because most of the movie is still good. <sighs> Some people would think the Song of the South, most of the movie is still good, too. Sure. That's supposed to be a historical representation, isn't it? Just like, you know, Gone with the Wind. Exactly. And you don't see them putting disclaimers out with Gone with the Wind every time. Because it's, everybody it's knows something. these days, you know. Well, so yeah. I know. I get it. I mean, you can't you can't ignore these things. I get it. So anyway, now that we've I've finished bashing Disney, <laughs> tell us about some rare Disney memorabilia. Being so Disney about. collectors and the enthusiasts now have a chance to get their hands on decades of coveted Disney memorabilia dating back to the 1950s. A History of Disneyland and Walt Disney World auction, which is being hosted by Van Easton Galleries, will be offering a collection of more than 1,500 collectible relics from the Disney dynasty. The auction is going to be pla uh, taking place between December 7th and 8th, and um, we'll have an exhibit that will actually be open to the public until December 6th. Now, I have no idea where this is. I didn't see anything in the article that stated where this was. Um, but bidders will be able to vie for historic props, posters, memorabilia um, from such rides as the Haunted Mansion, Space Mountain, and Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, the collection will also include original documents from the park's founding, um, including a rare copy of Walt Disney's original pitch for financing the Disneyland Park, containing descriptions and a hand-colored map of what Disney expected the park to look like. Now, what's really funny is the other night we were watching one of the new shows from Disney+. Plus. Um, it's an Imagineering show, and it was basically giving you the history of how, you know, Disneyland came to, to be and, and 
they had some of these props and things, and we were kind of joking, going, so I wonder how much that goes for. Yeah, yeah, you know, where, where are these at and how where much do, you, do they go yeah, for? Yeah, and all of a sudden, here's this article saying, hey, we're doing this big auction, and, and some of the pieces were things that we actually saw. Yeah, you know? it's kind of funny that, that this came out. I am curious, though, what is prompting Disney to do this? Are they that hard up for cash now that they need to have a yard sale? Is that what this is? No. Years you see this happen because I remember probably maybe t less than 10 years ago. I remember that there was another auction that came up and it was Disney props, but it was more movie props right. from different Disney movies and, and things like that. So I think it's just kind of, but some of this stuff, you is know, like, you know, really like special items like the stuff for the the right and i'm kind of surprised that they they, they don't open up a museum of yeah, it you know like, like and they've got you know right, several have, different places in disney world that they could display this right stuff. exactly like why not build a museum mm -hmm. of all of these different things you know or is it just something where you know it's too much money for them to keep repairing it or, or you now, know, I, do, I don't know. I, don't I know. do have to say that the cynical part of me wants to think that they're putting this stuff up for auction so people like Bob Iger can buy it who's going to be retiring from Disney in a couple mm. of years. Is that real? I'd love to see who won this stuff. If they're anonymous bidders, right. you know the fix is in at that point. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I so. don't know. We'll see. So early documents will be auctioned off alongside with whimsical theme park props and ride vehicles, art and iconic pieces. Uh, Disney fans will, you know, be able to, uh, you know, um, uh, recognize, you know, a lot of the pieces uh, like uh, two birds from the uh, Tiki Room. Um, and then uh, there's actually a hand-painted stretching painting from the Haunted Mansion. Um, and, you know, an, and what also is kind of cool is an opening day guidebook that's actually signed by Walt Disney himself. Which, again, why wouldn't you have that on display right. in Disneyland? The fact that they're <laughs> auctioning this off, know. I think, is... It's almost criminal. It really yeah, is. Yeah, like I, that I, I know, type you know, of like I could see if it was <laughs> like we have three versions of the same thing and we're auctioning off, you know, two of them or something. Right. You know, like we have so many of these versions of the thing we don't need as right. many. You know, this but was these a copy. Things some, should be on you know, display. Yeah, somewhere yeah. where the the diehard fans of Disney can, can go, go and, and see it. Everyone can enjoy mm -hmm. it. Yeah. What's going to happen is these are going to be auctioned off. They're going to go into a private collection somewhere. So maybe what we and do nobody's going to see them is, ever again. Is we get we go to the bank and we get a loan and we buy everything and then we open up a museum ourselves. I I don't like Disney <laughs> enough for that. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Okay, well it was an idea. Anyway, uh, was that all we had for our Disney detective? That was it. All right, we'll come back with our entertainment news. Give me some Star Wars news, my dear. <laughs> so uh, Daisy Ridley uh, was interviewed recently by Entertainment Weekly, and she was asked to describe the movie in three words, but she actually gave four. And Cheater. they were dark, scary, sad, and joyful. Okay. Um, so, you know, what, what does that mean? So dark, you know, could it mean that she's alluding to dark Ray who, you know, you've seen in the one with the switchblade lightsaber, right? Exactly. Okay. You know, could that be part of it? Uh, you know, or is it that she's, you know, her and Kylo Ren are kind of battling out like what's, what's dark about it? Um, scary, you know, well, Palpatine's back and, and. He's scary, so maybe that's, you know, what's scary. Um, or that the fate of the galaxy is in the balance, um, you know, so... But it, when isn't it, you know? True, true. Um, sad, you know, is it because it's the final movie within the uh, Skywalker sa saga? Or is it that, you know, this is Princess Leia's, you know, final movie? You know, is that part of the, the sadness? Um, you know, obviously we, we kind of know 
Leia is going to more than likely die at the end of this. So kind of hard that... not to have the character killed off here. Right, exactly. So was that, you know, sad? And then, you know, joyful is, you know, you can't have a hero's journey without a positive outcome in the end. So, you know, with every struggle and losses and battles, I guess you always have to have hope and hope can lead to joy. Um, so, you know, Hmm. Hints. Maybe not. Maybe leading you in the wrong direction. But you know, we're we're getting closer to uh, to opening day. Of- well, and you know, I th- I think uh, those four words are vague enough that they could be attributed to just about every Star Wars movie out there. <laughs> so to say that she's playing it safe, I, I oh, think would be uh, would be an overstatement. There. Right. Right. So um, I, I think. She's under, you know, obviously she's under oh, her gag order. She can't say anything. Absolutely nobody so can like, say anything. And that's That's okay. like saying, well, Star Wars, you're going to see space battles. <laughs> you're going to see like, some lightsabers. Thanks. Maybe, we wouldn't have expected lucky. that. Yeah. So, you know? But just another little thing to kind of tease, you know, as it's, you know, getting closer and, and, and everything. it's getting very close now. Very close. For, closer uh, for some people. That is that is true. We're almost almost a month away now. So, and I was invited mm-hmm. to a, a special screening right. for a special work thing. Well, it was. Uh-huh. It was. I have one of my vendors at work invited mm-hmm. me to a special screening. I have to sit through a you know oh, a presentation. Um, but it will have me seeing the uh, movie before the rest of the family. Mm. And we're not bitter at all. Not at all. No, nope. would never have guessed it. <clears throat> nope. So enough harping on Star Wars. <laughs> uh, tell us about SpongeBob. So a new SpongeBob SquarePants spinoff, described as a musical-based project, centered around SpongeBob's iconic neighbor octopus Squidward, is heading to Netflix, according to the New York Times. Is he an octopus or is he a squid? I don't because I always thought he was a squid, but That's I think I our daughter too. always said that he was an octopus. I don't know. I never bothered to, to count. Yeah. So the show, the show is reportedly part of a new multi-year deal between Nickelodeon and Netflix that was confirmed uh, earlier last week. Uh, one estimated that the report was a $20 million deal. Uh, the deal will see Nickelodeon produced a slate of original films, uh, animated films and series based on both existing and new characters. Um, the Times reported that Squidward's new adventure is one of the shows Netflix will receive as part of a nine-figure deal. Uh, a representative for Nickelodeon declined to confirm um you know, if Squidward's participation um, would be, uh, you know, if if he was going to be part of it. Um, so a separate SpongeBob SquarePants movie is actually already in the works um, at Paramount uh, Pictures. Um, Netflix and Nickelodeon have had a relationship prior to this announcement. Nickelodeon first made t- uh, TV movies like Rocco's Modern Life, um, Invader... Zim, sorry, there's a cat walking around underneath me. <laughs> Dorian woke up. <laughs> you can actually see her. She, she don't worry, she's she's fine. <laughs> she was taking a nap in the corner. Um, so they obviously had a, a you know a success, you know, doing uh, made for TV movies and things like that. Um, also, Netflix is set to receive a number of new Nickelodeon shows and films in the deal. Um, older uh, titles, you know, might be coming, um, you know, to them. Um, also, <coughs> excuse me, Amazon and Viacom uh, signed on for a deal, um, but that kind of uh, fell through uh, years ago. Um, now there is a chance that all of the SpongeBob library would be coming to net could end up on Netflix, but right now Nickelodeon actually has their own little streaming service uh, called Nick Hits and that runs with you know for the same amount that everybody else does at $7.99 so so that's guy. great so there's another uh, streaming service that we're going to wind up getting um, that will cost us you know that magic number I think is like Six dollars, seven dollars a month now. So now you can get fifty million different TV networks, uh, all streaming, 
all at uh, the same relative rate. And, uh, you know, Nick Lodian is, is getting in on the action now, too. So, interesting story. And, you know, I don't think we've seen too much exploration of... Uh, of Squidward in the right, past. Or some of the other, you know, characters. So it'll kind of be, you know, interesting to see. Um, the other thing too is there, there was a meme that came out or maybe it was a Twitter posting that actually talked about, you know, if you signed up for all of the streaming services, <laughs> so I tried to let the cat out of the bag. And she's just, it's so sad. Uh. So but anyway, if you signed up for all of the streaming services, you were actually spending more than if you just had regular, you know, cable. Right. So, and like over the lifetime, it was like astronomical how much. Well, but that's you know, the thing. You can cost. get your your TV a la carte now. The problem is you're going to pay top dollar for it. Right. Exactly. And that's why we even you know sat down and kind of figured you know do we need this one? Do we need this one? You know, and we kind of were like, well, we don't need Hulu anymore. You right. know, Disney Plus will take, you know, its place. <clears throat> but you have, you know, HBO Max. They just announced that they were going to be doing um, uh, a Friends uh, uh, reunion thing. You know, oh, and yeah, it's yeah, only going to be, yeah. you know, on there. So oh, if you want to watch that, you have to do that. Or, um, you know, uh, CBS All Access is going to have the Picard show. And it's like, oh, I really want to see that. But I don't want to buy well, it's like another. They already have the Star Trek one that I want to see, but right. I'm not going to buy right. the service for one show. It's right. not two shows. Right. So it's kind of like, all right, you know, there's just all this really good content that's out there, and you really do have to, you know, pick and choose, or you just get. Or you just wait for the whole season to drop, and then right. you get your you 30 day starter and watch everything at right. once. Yeah. So. And then cancel. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the last one we have in entertainment here is uh, a story about Negan. So, little pig, little pig, let me <laughs> in. Hey, that was good. Now, now you kind of understand. So, The Walking Dead obviously introduced a new villain all the way back in season six, and in that the seasons that followed, fans actually became kind of frustrated with uh, AMC. And, you know, many referred to as the Negan problem, both within the canon of the show and at home in their living rooms, you know, that actually drove away a lot of, of, of viewers. I actually had a couple of friends who had been, you know, longtime Walking Dead fans, watched it religiously, and as soon as Negan came, even though they knew he was going to be a, a bad guy stopped watching the show right. the, it was it became too hard for them to watch it was you know like the violence became too extreme what, what violence when he bashed a couple of people's heads in with a baseball bat it's not that bad well you know and there was just a lot after that you know that and i think binge watching it and also backpedaling because you got to see, like, when you met me, Negan, because don't forget. I you, didn't actually meet him. Right. Yeah. I mean, it no. would be. He, he would kind of be cool. I, I would, I would <laughs> love to Morgan meet him. Would, yeah. Would be I, kinda, I think he's pretty cool. But I think if you, you know, you, you have the fan who watched it in sequence, in the time frame that it, it went through, it kind of screwed up a lot of people just in the way it was like, I can't believe they did. Like, now, he was not in the comics, right? No, Negan is in the comics. Oh, he is. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So and then why would people not expect to see that? You know what? Because he was kind of bad, but he wasn't as bad. Just like in the comics, the governor was actually worse in the comic than he was in the show. Well, see, and the that's show. the thing. I so, think by the time Negan's introduced in season six... You needed an outsider. Right, who you needed could be another. Bad. Right, you because totally I'll did. I'll tell you, binge watching the whole thing. By the time I got to season six, I, I like 
I don't know why Rick Grimes was still involved in anything there because of how many bad mistakes and and how many times he's promised off and and never came through, right. or just the fact that he was out in the wilderness too long and and basically became a savage. Right. Yeah. You know, he to me he was like the bad guy. Right. He was the anti-hero. Right. So you kind of needed a Negan to come in and build him up just by being True. worse than him. Yeah, and I, and I think and again. Because I wonder how your reaction would have been of him if you had watched it as the majority of people had watched it from beginning to end, as opposed to watching season nine, <clears throat> ten, and then going back. Well, and that was through. the thing. Like, the main reason that I went back and watched everything was because I had no idea. So much of what he was in season nine were references back to the previous season. Oh, absolutely. And I had no clue what those references meant. Right. So I felt right. like such an outsider. No, and I and I totally get it. And I, you know, but again, I think my my take on this is if you had watched it as slowly as, right. you know, where, you know, we, you know, most people were watching it on a Sunday night and, you know, at 10 o'clock we're like, Whew, Whoa, well, that you know, and and going into work the following Monday, and you know the the water cooler talk of, oh my God, did you like? I can't believe they did that. Oh my God, that and was. And I'll total, tell you, you know, taken in the same light, had I watched the entire series one episode a week, I would have dropped it at season four because even binge watching season mm -hmm. four, yeah. Halfway through, I was so bored out of my mind. And and yeah, there were people that and and there were a lot of people I think that that came into it, left, kind of came back, you know. Oh, season four was terrible. But uh, it, just it bad script writing, right? Bad situations. It it ground so slow. You had no direction whatsoever. At mm -hmm. least when Negan came in. Oh yeah. Negan was a bad guy that everyone oh, could yeah. could and and like. He's not even introduced at first. Mm -mm. You know, you you run into the saviors a couple of times right, right. before you even get the Negan. Right. And I think that was the the whole thing, the anticipation and the build up and and people that had, you know, read the comics knew who was coming and, you know, and and knew the most of the bad things that he did, but now to to see him, you know, flesh and blood and like, wow, he's worse than I I thought. But anyway, what this article kind of talks about is how now, you know, the character of Negan has really become the best part of The Walking Dead. And, and you know, people, you know, that maybe kind of gave up on the show, you might be kind of willing to, to come back because, you know, he, he, he has a little bit of a softer side, but not really, because right. obviously we've seen the past couple of weeks. Yeah, the last last episode kind of has a nice, interesting little twist that tells you, you know, he's he's still, you know. He's still a, in there. He's still a crazy bag of cats upstairs. Right, because, you know, the other thing, too, it, you know, if you did stop watching it, you know, Negan was basically you know, imprisoned, um, in Alexandria for the last six years and, you know, has kind of, you know, nobody, you know, nobody really trusts him, but they kind of gave him a little bit of freedom. And then you see, you know, one of the, um, uh, the, the kids getting picked on and he kind of goes and, and saves her and, you know, as a result, this other person, you know, he kind of kills her by accident. So now, you know, there's havoc again. And then he meets, you know, uh, you know, he kind of escapes and he meets this this woman and her son and he's trying to protect them. And then, you know, this little psycho kid that had been, you know, his dad had been one of the original saviors, you know, is like, oh, I'm Negan. And, you know, there's a whole thing that happens. And, you know, again, yeah, he's trying he's to protect only, them. He's only had a couple of, of showcase episodes this season, but there's been so much character development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like just on his character in maybe two episodes. Yeah. There's been more character development mm -hmm. on Negan because it's such a good character. Yeah, yeah. And he's such a good actor. Oh playing my god, the role. he absolutely is. You know, and and we're fans of of Talking Dead, and you know, and you know, 
hearing the after shows and and everybody talking about you know Negan and and everything you know it's it's nice to kind of see the crazy come out again yeah. you know especially last week's episode um you know with him and the whispers and and everything and and that's the thing like when you saw the whispers show up the first time you mm-hmm. didn't realize that they were humans in in right right masks basically it was terrifying mm-hmm. and then you see alpha Right. And then you see Negan, and it's like, they're really nothing compared to what Negan was. You right, know? Like, right. Oh, like, absolutely. Like, they have a purpose. Like, they have a culture. They're they're almost right. like a cult. They're a cult. Whereas Negan was just so out of his mind crazy. Right, right. But also know? still a cult in a, a different way, but not everybody knew it was a cult. You know, or you had the worker cult, bees. It was and, a cult. Centered around a if, man, it wasn't right. a religion or a way of life. Right, where the whispers, the whispers are, totally... are kind of a way of life religion. Right, right. So the right. whispers are kind of like their own little religion, whereas uh, Negan is almost like his own little fiefdom. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's, it, it was more of a government style cult mm-hmm. than a like religious style yeah. cult. Yeah, so it was an interesting, you know, article talking about how, you know, Negan's obviously, you know, made a, a comeback and, and so to speak, and you're you're finally getting to see him how he was and and how you know ha- how this is gonna you know potentially play out. So if it's something where you were a fan and you kind of gave up on it, you know, it might not be a bad time to revisit, kind of fast forward, you know, all those bad times and and have a, a fresh look at it. So. Yeah. Very cool. So I think that does it for our entertainment news this week. Mm -hmm. And we will be back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick of the week. So probably for the next couple of weeks, I could see our insightful picks kind of coming from Disney Plus, which, you know, not, not such a bad thing. Um, so my insightful pick is a show uh, that actually originally debuted in 2017. They kind of just did it as, as a pilot, one-off, and uh, never really did anything else with it, but then went to uh, Disney+, Plus, and now it's going to be a weekly uh, series, and it is called Encore. Um, so it's a reality show hosted um, and executive produced by Kristen Bell. Um, like I said, the series actually had a pilot in December of 2017, but officially premiered on Disney Plus, obviously on November 12th. And what the series is, is it reunites cast members of a high school musical to recreate their performance years after it was originally performed. So in the um, first episode, it was Annie and it was back. Um, the original cast was from 1996. Uh, and it, it's a cute show. Um, I'm actually almost halfway through uh, the second episode, uh, which is Beauty and the Beast, um, which was from uh, a Texas high school uh, from 2007. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see, you know, the the different stages. Um, you know, so basically they get all of the cast you know, to come back and you kind of see where everybody is now in their life, um, you know, 10 or or 20 years later, um, you know, and it's kind of interesting, um, you know, so in the Beauty and the Beast show, you had two of the the kids, they were high school sweethearts. And then, you know, they haven't seen each other in 10 years because they broke up uh, during high school, you know, graduation. Um, so it's interesting to to see, you know, who made it big or who, you know, uh, it, what was kind of funny was in, in this one episode, um, they went back to one of the um, their parents' house and she actually had a box of all the stuff from Drama Club. So all of the uh, um, the playbills and everything. So they were oh, looking cool. through it and kind of like, you know, when you, you know, if you were ever in, you know, any production at school and you had to write your little bio and it was like, so and so wants to, you know, go to Broadway and make it big and da 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 da. And then they had something else and they, they looked it up and like the one kid, um, he had always wanted to be a performer or something, and he actually is. So it was kind of funny how they were like, oh, my God, this is yeah. – I really did that. 
um, what was interesting with it's the... It's kind of like a real-life version of Glee. Yeah, sort of. it's like Glee, you know, the reunion show, you right. know. And, and it's neat because, you know, you get to see... Um, you know, like I said, so in um, in the first episode, which was Annie, the the girl that played Annie, the woman now, she actually did go to New York um, and did a couple of off Broadway shows, and then met someone, got married, and and moved back, you know, to Calif- uh back to Texas, or yeah, back to to California, um, you know, and never really made it big and then you know there were other people that you know one person became a a sheriff and you know you had a couple of different teachers and and things like that and it was just kind of you know interesting to see you know because I remember there was one person that I was in drama club with and like if anyone was going to make it she was going to be that one and you know I've Every now and then I try looking her up online to see if I can find anything and, you know, social media now, you know, most of your your graduating class is there in some way, shape or form or somebody at least knows somebody else. And she happens to be that one that nobody's heard from. So, right. you know, you wonder, oh, I wonder what happened. Did she change her name? Or Probably in Bollywood now. <laughs> Maybe that's what she did. She went and and did that. So, you know, for someone who was in drama club and, you know, it's it's kind of interesting to see, you know, we all do grow up, but we all still, you know. I resent that. I never grow up. (laughs) Well, no, you have Darth Vader behind you. You'll never grow up. (laughs) Um, And I have mouse ears behind me, so I'll never grow up. But it's, it's a nice show. So, you know, especially if you were in, you know, in some sort of high school production of something or your choir or something like that. And, you know, and, and and it's interesting to see how, you know, like they admit they weren't good singers and they weren't good dancers. And what's neat is, you know, they basically have like a week to get ready to do this show and to put it on and they, you know, and they'll bring in extras to kind of help. And what was uh, neat was for the beauty and the beast one. Um, I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but the woman who played the original Belle shows up to kind of help, you know, give everybody pointers and and things like that. So that was really, really kind of cool, you know, so really cute show if, you know, if you're into, you know, musicals or you were into that in high school, um, you know, hour long episodes. Really fun show. Good pick. Thank you. So this is uh, Encore, streaming Mm -hmm. on Disney+. Plus. Uh, Schedule when it drops, do we know? Uh, Every Friday, it looks like. Every Friday, nice. Awesome. Well, we'll be back with my pick momentarily. So my pick, uh, actually, I had a pick set lined up for Mm -hmm. this week. And then? From a different streaming service. And then Disney Plus landed, <laughs> and I had to preempt my original pick. Hmm, um, I wonder what it is. This week's insightful pick is none other than The Mandalorian. It was, <laughs> episode one was just awesome. Um, and I was relating a story to you earlier. Uh, I went to work, and I have a friend at work who's a you know big Star Wars fan, and I happened to be in a in a meeting with with my staff, and he pokes his head in, and all he said was, "Did you?" And I said, "Yeah, did you?" And he's like, "Yeah." I'm like, and he's like, "What'd you think?" I said, "It was awesome." He's like, "Yeah, it was awesome." And my staff are looking at me like, "Did we just miss like <laughs> some kind of language or something like that? What are you people talking about?" Um, and that's literally all the conversation mm-hmm. was at yeah, that point. Yeah. So. Here's the the byline on The Mandalorian. After the stories of Jango and Boba Fett, another warrior emerges in the Star Wars universe. The Mandalorian is set after the fall of the Empire and before the emergence of the First Order. We follow the travails of a lone gunfighter in the outer reaches of the galaxy, far from the authority of the New Republic. <laughs> As the tumbleweed goes. So episode one was a spaghetti western in space. Mm-hmm. It was action from start to finish. Mm-hmm. Um, you had your bar scene. You didn't get bogged down <laughs> with challenging dialogue you had to decipher. No, no. Um, but 
aside from the action aspect of it, the one thing that I love is they're delving into the lore. Mm -hmm. It's like one of the big complaints that I've had about all the new Star Wars movies, because I I have a tendency of reading all the novels in addition to the comics before I watch the movies. And a lot is established. I mean, let's face it. The Star Wars universe is huge. Right. So there's a lot of things that are established in the Star Wars universe that don't show up in the movies, but they're mm-hmm. alluded to in the movies. Right. So the problem is, is that the average person doesn't read the books. 90 plus percent of the people that go to see these movies aren't reading the books and getting these backstories. So the first thing that they do here is they establish a very fundamental thing to Mandalorians, and that is what they call Beskar. And Beskar, in the in the show early on, it's handed to him as payment for a bounty, and it's handed to him like a bar of metal, almost like a gold bar, mm-hmm. or a gold bullion. And the audience is sort of left to believe that it's just a valuable mineral that that's used for currency, and it's not. What it is is a type of metal that's only mined on the Mandalorian home world, and they're trying to give it back. He's They're trying to collect it back. Now, I don't know how the story's going to go at this point, but I'm going to go based strictly on what I've read in the novels, and that is that when the Empire came and they... Minus all the backstory, they they took over Mandalore, the Mandalorian home planet, and they basically stole all the Beskar that mm-hmm. the planet had. And now there's a quest, almost like a like a uh, like a holy quest, which they make reference to in the second episode, to get this back, get this heritage back, and and in the first episode. They actually show you that they use this to build their armor. So now you're starting to get this, uh, the aura. You're starting to understand the aura of Mandalorian armor and weapons and their their warlike um, religion almost. So they're doing a really good job of not throwing everything at you at one time, mm-hmm. but you can kind of see they're planting the seeds here to right. give you that lure so that probably by the end of the season, you're going to know so much more. Right. It's not just about some guy out there. It's not Dog the Bounty Hunter in space. Right. You know, (laughs) it's not dragging people out of the streets because there's a price on their heads. There's real story to it. Mm -hmm. And to top it all off, there's a very big surprise at the end of the first episode. (laughs) That everybody goes like crazy about. In, in the, the second, second episode. Yeah. So the first episode is very much a spaghetti western. There's drama, there's action. The second one, there's humor. Right. So to see in those just the first two episodes, to see that kind of contrast mm-hmm. and that kind of depth is just it's fantastic. It really is. Yeah. Um it seeing these two has largely restored my faith in the franchise after uh, the Last Jedi, because that the Last Jedi just shattered the entire franchise for mm-hmm. me and and millions of other Star Wars fans. But watching the first two episodes of this actually has me excited for Star Wars once again. And though. and honestly, I haven't heard a bad review from anyone that that's watched it. Like right. everybody, I had read one critical review that said the first episode was a snooze fest, and I'm thinking. Well, yeah, because before we even watched it on on Tuesday night, you had said, oh, well, I didn't, you know, I heard a bad review. And we're like, oh, okay. Yeah, and it's like, I you don't know, know how you could come what, up with that after what, that episode <laughs> what was unless you were on, like, cold medication when you tried to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely, It now, was literally. Right, like, some people were more. Start ex- to finish, right, it was action. Right, exactly. Some people were a little bit more excited about it, you know, than others, but still nobody that that I knew or that I read said, you know, a bad thing about it. It moved very well. The first episode was 39 minutes. The second was 31 minutes. 31 or 32. You know, they're not not long. And they tell so much story in that amount of time. And and what's very interesting is 
the second episode, the first 10 minutes, there's absolutely no dialogue. Right. And there's so much emotion. If I had to compare that... it to anything, I would have to compare it. And, and Star Wars fans will remember this. Years ago, after, um, almost immediately after, I think, Revenge of the Sith came out, you had the uh, Gennady Tarkatov uh, Clone Wars short series. They were 15-minute skits that they would do. And they were very similar, like, in style to this, where there was a ton of story that was crammed into these 15-minute little segments here. But there was a lot that was left between the cracks that you could fill in. Mm -hmm. They gave you enough so that you knew what the story was, but they didn't give you too much, mm. you know? And right. that's exactly what this is. They're giving you enough to sort of draw the lines between the dots. Okay. <clears throat> but they're leaving a lot on the table there. And, and you know, for diehard Star Wars fans like myself... They keep you wondering, is this right. really what it is? Is this, you know, what's this, you know, character's race? Right. You know, what does this guy look like? How come, you know, his armor's so clean and, you know, like the weapon, okay? So, right, so right. The, you see the weapon that he carries and it's a forked rifle. Mm -hmm. And that forked rifle was actually specifically carried into that show uh, by John Favreau. Right. Because it appeared at the first appearance of Boba Fett right. as an animated skit in the holiday special, the Star Wars right. holiday special. Right. So just well, the and, fact that they're going to that length to bring that kind of lore in. Right. And they even talk about Life Day, which right. was also right. part There's of the holiday of special. Life Day. So there were a lot of little Easter eggs. Right. You know. And in and, and an interview that John Favreau did uh, early on, he had said that it was his way of, of making the holiday special uh, canon once again because mm -hmm. George Lucas hates it and wanted it removed. So I'm um, very happy with it. Looking forward to the rest of the uh, uh, episodes that we're waiting to drop. It is dropping on Fridays for the most part. Uh, well, it is dropping on Fridays, but there are some breaks in the schedule mm -hmm. from the published schedule that I saw. Right, right. And it is streaming on Disney+. Plus. So, The Mandalorian. And I think that's all we had this week. Did mm -hmm. we have any afterthoughts or anything? No, nothing today. No, we'll run down the contacts. We would love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, um, snide remarks, anything you'd like us to talk <laughs> Just about. Just anything. Just email us. Uh, email us at <laughs> comments at in the insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at... At insights underscore things. You can get our video on uh, www.youtube.com slash insights into things. On the web at www.insightsintothings.com. You can get our audio versions at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast and if you are watching us live on twitch don't forget to subscribe and uh subscribe to both the audio and the video podcast on our website and we'll be back next week with another great podcast mm -hmm. another one in the books all righty we're out of here wow.